Right. Well, I, I think we're good to go. It's 9.30. Good morning and welcome. I'm Alex Vatanka, the director of the Iran program and senior fellow of the Frontier Europe Initiative here at the Middle East Institute in Washington. And I'm pleased to welcome you all to today's event, Conflict Between Azerbaijan and Armenia, Scope and Implications. The conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan has entered its fourth week. The implications of the war have not been limited to the combat zone, resulting in civilian casualties and destroyed civil infrastructure. The broader region is not immune to this latest round of fighting and critical energy infrastructure is at risk, threatening the connection of the Caspian Basin with European markets. Today, we have an esteemed panel to discuss the ongoing conflict and the implications of the threats to vital energy infrastructure. First, I would like to welcome Margarita Asanova. Margarita is a senior fellow at the Jamestown Foundation, also based here in Washington, DC. Next, we have Rauf Mamadov. Rauf is a resident scholar on energy uh, policy here at the Middle East Institute and a good colleague of mine. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce Mamuka Seretelli. Uh, Mamuka is a non-resident scholar with the Frontier Europe Initiative also here at the Middle East Institute and a, another good colleague of mine. Uh, Middle East Institute's Frontier Europe program explores interactions between the Middle East countries and their European neighbors. The parts of Eastern Europe, Central Asia and the Caucasus, which form a frontier between Western Europe, Russia and the Middle East. For more information on this program, please visit our website or follow the Frontier program Twitter at MEI Frontier. For today's discussion, to submit your questions, please use Zoom's Q&A feature, which you can find on your Zoom screens. For those calling in by phone or watching our panel on the live stream, you can ask a question by emailing events at mei.edu. If you have any technical issues, please email events at mei.edu. Feel free to ask a question at any time throughout the panel. I'll be looking at all of your questions and will factor in as many as possible into the uh, discussion this morning. So with that said, uh, let me um, come back to my screen here. I can see our uh, panel members and I'll start with Rauf before moving on to Mamuka and Margarita. Rauf, this is not a new war. Uh, this is just the latest round of conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan. We had conflict as recently as 2016, in July of this year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but this time it seems to be different. Certainly the conflict has lo lasted longer than um, what we've seen uh, in, in recent years. There's the issue of domestic politics in Armenia and Azerbaijan. We're not going to get into the history and the politics of it, but it's just a factor to bear in mind. There is a factor that we will discuss today, which is the geopolitical shifts that are going on in and around the South Caucasus involving countries like Turkey, Russia, Israel, United States, even perhaps Iran. What we do know for a fact is that the conflict is impacting or could easily impact some of the critical uh, energy infrastructure, including pipelines that take oil and gas from the Caspian to uh, European markets, global markets. And I know, hopefully we'll get to this, we have some big energy projects that are uh, in the final stages to be launched, to come uh, uh, on stream, to deliver energy to, to markets in Europe. So let me start by asking you, Ralph, to give us a, the big picture, the big sense. What does the South Caucasus mean in terms of energy? Why should people in Washington and elsewhere in the West care? Um, so give us some numbers, give us a sense of what we're talking about here when we talk about the threats posed to energy sector. Ralph, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Yeah, I will. I will uh, weigh in on what's going on in the in the overall in the energy industry and how that affects the South Caucasus and how actually the South Caucasus is contributing to these processes. But before that, yeah, I think you've mentioned about the first war. Yes, this is exactly what it is, it's unfortunately uh, the, the belligerent sides have, have been unable to uh, to solve the problem uh, for the quarter century. Uh, unlike the first war, uh, which happened between 1991 and 1994, 
now there are uh, critical energy infrastructure. During the first war, Azerbaijan uh, didn't have these infrastructure. There was no oil and gas pipelines go through Azerbaijan. So that wasn't the issue back then. Uh, all these uh, pipelines and infrastructure have been built after that. Um, why the South Caucasus is important? Uh, first of all, it's important because uh, the Caspian Basin, especially the Azerbaijan's oil and gas reserves, are the only westbound uh, pipelines, except Russia, that are supplying oil and gas uh, to European and global markets. Um, Secondly, uh, uh, the availability of the infrastructure that has been built, not only in the South Caucasus, namely uh, from Azerbaijan through Georgia and Turkey, uh, but also uh, we're talking about the completion of, uh, of a major gas pipeline that uh, will be supplying gas uh, from Caspian Basin to Italy. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we are very close uh, to that date when that Southern Caucasus pipeline will be commissioned, uh, which will be will bring um, the only alternative pipeline gas uh, to Europe. Now, why that is important? Um, for those who are not aware of the, uh, the situation in the EU, uh, Europe is heavily dependent on Russian gas. Uh, up until 2019, uh, one third of all the supplies uh, came from Russia. And unfortunately, Russia uh, had been prone to deploy this uh, the pipeline gas uh, as, as a foreign policy tool uh, in respect to the Ukraine, uh, not only once, but twice. Uh, it has done the same uh, to, to Belarus, which has not been actually discussed that much. But uh, there's, a, there's a pattern that Russia has been using uh, the energy dependence of Europe uh, in its uh, political gains. So uh, when, when the Ukraine crisis happened, this was an alarm for Europe and Europe decided to diversify its uh, pipeline imports. And the, one of the viable options that the only actually, uh, in hindsight, the only pipeline that has been uh, built uh, since then was the Southern Caucasus pipeline, um, which is about to be commissioned. Now, this is not the only uh, infrastructure which is in Azerbaijan. There has already been oil and gas pipelines running through the same corridor. Uh, the first one, of course, the baku tbilisi jehan pipeline. Uh, actually, the, uh, the decision, the final investment decision to build the pipeline was uh, was possible only after the ceasefire from uh, after the first war. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. Um, uh, which is supplying around six hundred thousand barrels of oil uh, to 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 Jehan Adana um, in Turkey. Uh, there is also a Baku Tiflis Erzurum pipeline, the gas pipeline that supplies gas only to Turkey. Uh, Azerbaijan also has uh, northern uh, pipeline, the pipelines that go to the northern direction. And one of them is uh, Baku Novorossiysk pipeline, which supplies oil uh, to, to Russia. Uh, coming to the conflict, the um, what happened in, in, in July in uh, just before this war was actually a red flag for, for, for the, for the industry because in July, uh, for the first time in the in the history of this conflict, um, there was a skirmish in the um, in the Tobuz border, which is um, right where uh, the pipelines uh, run through. This is very close to Azerbaijani and Georgian border. I think we'll have maps and we'll see that. Uh, but um, so that was a red flag because that was the first time when these uh, hostilities came close to the uh, to the to the infrastructure. About we're talking about. Uh, 20, 30 miles to the to the pipeline infrastructure. Um, then there was um, rocket attacks. Uh, uh, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan's major cities uh, were hit, um, and uh, some of these rockets fell um, along the corridor where the pipeline goes through. So that was another indication. But um, overall, the industry is is seems concerned about this. There are precedents. Uh, we, in last year, we've seen attacks on the critical infrastructure in Saudi Arabia, for instance, in, in Abigail. Uh, that was a game changer for the industry when critical facilities were hit. Therefore, um, it's it's reasonable for the industry and for the for, for the policymakers to uh, to understand whether uh, how how critical 
uh, this problem is and whether uh, we should uh, we should expect any disruptions uh, in the future from this uh, from these attacks. So that's the overall general picture of of what we are seeing right now. Uh, the the Southern Caucasus pipeline has uh, the consortium has announced that uh, the the pipeline which goes through the six countries uh, have already been filled with the gas. So we're talking about um, uh, you know, process when we are about to launch, uh, Azerbaijan is about to launch the pipeline. Um, there, another development, I guess, that that probably uh, brings attention is the, the changing dynamics in the in the in the gas industry, especially in the region, uh, especially the Turkey's gas imports. Uh, for the last four months, Turkey Turkey's gas import portfolio have changed drastically. Um, Turkey has been importing again, has been reliant on Russian gas mainly. More than 50% of Turkish imports were generally from Russian gas. But recently, for the last three or four months, uh, Azerbaijan has superseded uh, Russia and has, has gained the uh, upper hand in supplying in gas to Turkey. So that's another uh, development that's happening in the region. Um, overall, in the industry, uh, we're, we're, we're observing abundance in the market. Um, so that's, that's something to note. Um, but that's that's a general uh, overview of the situation in the market and in in Azerbaijan, and I'll come to specific questions if you guys you guys have any. Thank you, Rav. I do have a quick follow up question before I move over to Mamuka. But um, you know, you you gave us a wonderful overview, um, and there are a lot of things to to sort of discuss. Um, two things jumped at me. One is you you made the point that the additional new energy infrastructure that exists today that didn't exist say 15, 20 years ago, makes this for the energy industry so much more of a uh, risky proposition to see this conflict continue or perhaps even, God forbid, expand. But the other aspect of it, you have military capabilities on both sides have not remained static. They have changed and there are people who are saying that Azerbaijan's militarily in a different position today, it, it was few years ago. I don't know if we get to that, but I just wanted to put those two points out there because I do want to sort of, uh, for the audience to be able to visualize when we talk about energy, a threat to energy infrastructure, what are we talking about? Uh, but we get to that. Uh, but uh, and Ralph, can, I, can I just add one more thing? My, my apologies, something to, I forgot. The only disruption by the way, that happened to the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline through it throughout its almost two decade operation was happened during the 2008 Georgian Russian Georgian War. Um, so any uh, any military conflict automatically poses a threat uh, to disruption. Uh, back then, that happened in in Turkey's territory, but it did happen uh, throughout the the war. So that's something just uh, food for thought. Thank you, uh, Ralph. Let me, we'll, we'll come back to some of those points um, because I think you, you set the stage nicely for Mamuka. Mamuka, I mean, a number of countries were mentioned just now by, by Rauf. Um, I don't want to, uh, you know, I know you're going to show us a map. You're going to explain this in detail, but try maybe if you can tell us in your mind if there have been any so far sort of losers and winners in, in terms of stakeholders in this conflict as far as the energy industry is concerned. I mean, some of the shifting dynamics here. Turkey that used to get more gas from Russia is not getting as much gas from Russia as it did and so forth. So, And, and Marguerite is going to talk later about the European markets and potential impact there because of this conflict. But uh, Mamuka, please go ahead and, and show us your wonderful map and um, uh, what you see in terms of the bigger geopolitical play here. Thanks, Alex. Um, uh, thanks to uh, everyone for uh, participating and being part of this event. Uh, yes, I think I should say that probably the immediate impact at this stage on uh, markets is not there and uh, uh, oil and gas is continuing to flow through the pipelines and uh, markets are supplied by uh, committed amounts of natural gas and oil. And uh, this, uh, there was no direct impact, as I said. Of course, if uh, conflict is prolonged, and stays there for a long period of time, risks are increasing. Probably risk premiums for insurance and other purposes are also increasing already because of the uh, military operations in the region uh, uh, for this particular business, energy business, but also probably for other businesses. So it's not good, obviously, for any party that, is, that, is, uh, that has interest in this, in this region. But as, as, uh, as 
you mentioned uh, in terms of question, uh, there was no direct immediate impact at this stage. One, should, one thing probably should, should be mentioned that pipelines that are crossing the region are buried in the ground. So they are more or less protected from that perspective. Maybe we should, uh, if you can show the map, first map. Um, these are maps from open sources. So I think this is Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty map. Uh, and by the way, the scale is not exact and uh, pipelines may not be crossing uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh area that close as it's shown in this map. There is still some distance between uh, uh, pipelines and the Nagorno-Karabakh, but uh, approximate kind of uh, approximation is there. So you see several maps, uh, several pipelines here. One is uh, the, the green one is Baku Supsa pipeline, which is about 100,000 uh, uh, barrels a day pipeline, which is operational right now. Uh, that's uh, one of the first pipelines that was built in the region, so-called Western Route pipeline, connecting Baku to uh, Black Sea port of Supsa, located in Georgia. Uh, then Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, this is a red line that uh, connects Baku with the uh, port of Jehan in, in, uh, in Turkey, in the Mediterranean, uh, which has capacity of 1 million barrels, and, but operational, as uh, Rauf was mentioning, about 600, uh, between six and 700,000 uh, barrels a day, depending on uh, <clears throat> different inputs. Uh, it, by the way, this pipeline ships not only Azerbaijani gas, but also uh, oil, but also oil from uh, some other producing countries in, in, Turkmen, uh, in Turkmenistan, from Caspian, from Turkmenistan, uh, Kazakhstan, sometimes even Russia. And then uh, a very important pipeline, uh, Baku Felicity uh, Erzurum pipeline, so-called South Caucasus uh, gas pipeline, which is also connected to Trans-Anatolian pipeline and system of pipelines that's supposed to bring uh, natural gas to Europe, to Italy, as Rauf was mentioning. So uh, now, uh, why don't we look at the second map briefly, and then uh, I'll say a few words about uh, my concerns uh, with regard to what is going on. So you see, uh, uh, again, this is open source map, and I cannot claim that this is all exact uh, sort of uh, uh, dimensions and everything, but you see this place on the north called Talish, uh, north of Nagorno-Karabakh, and this is not far from, uh, uh, from the pipeline. But what uh, the area that was mentioned, mentioned um, a little um, by Ralph, little, um, little area in, in, in his conversation is up in north, closer to uh, where borders of, of uh, Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan and Georgia are. So there is this uh, Armenian time, town Taush, that's where July uh, conflict took place. Uh, uh, but going back to this uh, current uh, military operation areas, you see south of uh, south uh, Nagorno-Karabakh uh, proper, uh, which is in, in green color, south of this, you see several cities like Jebrail, uh, Fizuli, and some others where uh, it used to be uh, under Armenian control, now it's under control of uh, Azerbaijani military. Let's remove these maps and let's focus on a few other uh, important issues. I would like to uh, say a few words, uh, Alex, about role of Russia. I think uh, everybody expected uh, uh, Russia to be immediately sort of jumping in and uh, trying to stop parties uh, uh, from escalation of conflict. Uh, because of the uh, long-term uh, relationship between Armenia and Russia, because of the treaty uh, agreement that is between Russia and, um, and Armenia on so-called, uh, what is called collective security treaty. Uh, uh, so both are parties of this, of this treaty, of course. Uh, and I think uh, uh, there was expectation uh, that uh, Russia would, uh, would come in and um, and somehow intervene to stop the conflict. But so far, Russia is uh, relatively, uh, relatively passive. There are some diplomatic efforts, uh, several calls for cease ceasefire and meetings in Moscow between uh, foreign uh, relations, foreign, uh, foreign affairs ministers of uh, Russia, Azerbaijan, and Ar Armenia. But so far, those didn't deliver any uh, tangible results. 
Now, uh, some uh, interpret this as an inability to Russia really influence size. And I strongly disagree with that because I think Russia has lots of tools and leverages to uh, impact parties. But at this stage, there are multiple reasons why Russia may not be intervening in a more proactive manner. And we can discuss it and speculate about those. But there are a couple that I would like to bring. First of all, uh, I think, uh, uh, I mean, if you think about there are strictly energy related issues and there are some geopolitical issues. So if you talk about geopolitical issues, uh, uh, obviously Russia doesn't want to see Turkish active role in this conflict and doesn't want to see uh, Turkey taking more in, in larger influence in, in South Caucasus. So from, on that, from that perspective, Russia is supposed to be more proactive. But there are also some other dimensions. Uh, let's say if you take uh, recent developments in last several last recent, uh, last several years, yes. So uh, changes in a, in a, in a uh, Armenian government and uh, uh, arrival to power of uh, uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan and his party, uh, I think, made some some differences. This is something that uh, that Russia always uh, was uh, fearful of color revolutions and revolutions that change power, change balance of power from, uh, from uh, parties and uh, political groups that are closer to, to Moscow to some uh, relatively less uh, in, impacted by Russian influenced parties. So I think uh, one, um, one reason why Russia may be passive in this, uh, in this uh, conflict at this stage, maybe that to see uh, to demonstrate how dependent Armenia is on Russia and Russian support, to also in, emphasize that every Armenian leader should be, first of all, thinking about the uh, impact that, that Russia-Armenia relationships have on, on security and long-term uh, uh, security and so stability in, in, uh, of Armenian state. And, and on, from the other point of view, if you look at uh, uh, recent uh, several years of, of uh, bilateral Russian-Azerbaijani uh, relationships, I think it's essential to mention that uh, Azerbaijan is not seeking any uh, membership in NATO or European Union. So it's, it, it's, it's buys, it buys uh, uh, Russian armaments in addition to some other sources of, of supply. So uh, from, the, from the point of view of Moscow and Putin, uh, uh, preventing uh, a, proactively at this stage uh, uh, military operations and advancement of Azerbaijan may be considered as uh, somehow uh, not very comfortable position for Russia because of all the things that are happening in terms of internal political dynamics in different countries of, of surrounding Russia. Well, one uh, last point on this, and I, I have one other point to make before we move um, uh, to other speakers. Uh, I think uh, it's essential to mention that uh, uh, you mentioned Turkey and Raouf mentioned about Turkish energy. Russia has to play a very, very careful uh, kind of game here. Russia has natural gas agreements on supply of Turkey, uh, long-term contracts. One of them expires next year. It's for 8 BCM, 8,000 8, uh, billion cubic meters. Another one expires in about five years. I think it's more at larger contracts, 16 billion cubic meters. So while on one hand, Russia wants to see this conflict, in my opinion, to be prolonged so that it could sort of demonstrate that uh, stability uh, uh, of, of Southern corridor a geopolitical environment of Southern gas corridor is not there for larger volumes of natural gas to be shipped to Europe and larger dependency uh, or growing dependency of growing supply to European markets of natural gas. On the other hand, Russia is forced to play a uh, uh, more kind of balanced game here and also think about how important uh, Turkish market is for its, for its supplies. So, and uh, one probably last point that um, uh, I wanted to mention here is that uh, both sides, I think, in the conflict, uh, Armenian uh, side and Azerbaijani side, uh, obviously they wanted to change the status quo somehow uh, for, 
for many years. Uh, on one hand, uh, uh, Armenian side wanted to have some kind of diplomatic breakthrough to get recognition of this uh, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh as an as a independent state. And uh, unfortunately, in my opinion, I think uh, leadership of Armenia miscalculated uh, by uh, taking some diplomatic steps in recently by announcing that they are disregarding um, uh, Madrid principles uh, of, of settlement of the conflict. There were some other moves uh, in relation to uh, balance of, of, uh, of relationships, I would say, internally, something like moving uh, decision to move uh, uh, parliament of Nagorno-Karabakh into Shusha and, and several other, other steps. Uh, that uh, actually, in a sense, while it was designed to uh, change status quo in favor of Armenia, I think it produced uh, opposite results. What I'm also worried about that there is expectation now uh, on Azerbaijani side that military advancements could really somehow resolve uh, this this conflict militarily, and uh, while uh, while progress, I mean, the military military uh, success is at this stage uh, visible. I don't think that uh, Russia will ever allow this conflict to be resolved militarily, with, even with the, with the Turkey being part of part of the process. So uh, I think prolonged conflict is in Russia's interest at this stage because it damages image of of South Caucasus, uh, uh, Southern Gas Corridor, and South Caucasus as a stable place. And uh, it also gives Russia lots of leverage to influence parties uh, through different means. So uh, why I mentioned mention this, because I think at this stage, interest of changing status quo from Azerbaijani side also has its own limits. So both sides somehow be, should be very, very careful going forward how, what they can achieve under the current circumstances. Uh, so that's my um, initial remarks. Sorry about long. No, no, thank you very much, uh, Mamuka. I, let me just, uh, as a follow-up, which I'll have for everyone, uh, I mean, the, the issue of uh, what game Russia is playing, obviously, I think is of huge interest to anyone listening. If there is this deliberate Russian uh, effort to uh, deliberately not intervene to end the conflict as a way of reminding Armenia who it owes its security to, but also to remind end users of oil and gas in Europe that this, you know, the, the infrastructure that they have built or they have committed themselves to invest it in through, uh, from Caucasus through Turkey is not as secure uh, or reliable as they might have thought. We'll get to that. I'm sure everyone has a comment, but here's a quick question uh, for you, Mamuka. Uh, what I heard you say about Russian policies towards Armenia and, and not being happy with some of the actions of uh, Prime Minister Pishanyan, um, it kind of re reminds me of what was happening in recent months in Belarus. But finally, the Russians did come to the, to the aid of their friend in, in Minsk. So um, I guess my, my question is, when do you think that might happen? I mean, is there is there a time where you see the Russians say enough is enough, I'm gonna help Armenia to sort of bring this to an end. And number two, could could this policy backfire? Could this lead the Armenians to think actually, you know what, we, we don't have the, the Russians the way we thought we had them. And maybe we need to reconsider our kind of geopolitical friends out there. I would start from your second question, probably. At this stage, unfortunately, uh, Armenia is a hostage of this uh, last last 30 years of, of of developments and un unfortunately for Armenia, probably there is not much uh, options they have strategically at this stage, uh, other than somehow miraculously, if all the parties come to some kind of harmonious decision of, of, uh, of deciding this conflict in a, in a peaceful manner, which is probably unrealistic to expect. Other than that, Armenia has, again, way things were developing last 30 years, has other um, other options other than uh, relying on Russia. On your first uh, question, I think uh, Mr. Pashinyan and Mr. Lukashenko are two very different characters. And uh, uh, Lukashenko is still sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, closer in terms of uh, his character and leadership style and so forth to President Putin. So he came he came to uh, rescue at uh, at the kind of right point from from Moscow's perspective. Whether Moscow will come to save uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan as a as a political leader, 
I, I'm not sure. Uh, he may, Russia may or may not do that. And maybe just changing the leadership of Armenia is one of the objectives that uh, Russia may be pursuing. Thank you, Mamuka Margarita. I'm coming to you now. And my question for you was the following. Could you please discuss the role and interest of the United States? And bearing in mind, if I understand it correctly, that there will be a meeting uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, Mike Pompeo, will be meeting the foreign ministers of Armenia and Azerbaijan Friday. I don't know if they're going to meet all together or separate meetings, but the question I have is if you could assess the role of the United States. Frankly, it's not making a lot of headlines out there. If there is a role, they're playing a very quiet game. We have a question here from uh, the Lo Los Angeles Times. Uh, the question is, is there a general feeling that the Trump administration has favored one side in this conflict, namely Armenia? Uh, if, uh, if so, can the United States be an honest broker in attempting to restore calm? Thank you very much. I want to make a couple of uh, remarks before I go to the question about the United States and the United States interests and capability to uh, intervene and uh, broker a peace agreement. Uh, first of all, the conflict that started uh, 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, actually in 88, um, within the Soviet Union, and nobody paid attention to it because it was within the, uh, the uh, empire, the Soviet empire, and uh, the conflict did not have much uh, impact in the region and internationally. And now we have a completely different situation. The region has developed economically in terms of trade with the European Union, in terms of uh, uh, military development and cooperation with uh, NATO and with the United States as well. So we have a very, very different situation. The region has been a bridge between Europe and Central Asia, but it's also a bulwark. Um, so it connects the countries of uh, Turkey, Iran, Russia, but also connects the entire European con continent through, um, through uh, uh, South Caucasus with Central Asia. It is also very important to China because China's Road and Belt Initiative also goes through, through the region. So when we're talking about US interests here, it's very important to remember that this region was a essential part of Northern Distribution Network uh, that was uh, providing uh, uh, routes uh, of supply of supplies and, and flights to Afghanistan and from Afghanistan. In fact, Azerbaijan is the country with most of the flights uh, to Afghanistan by NATO uh, planes uh, during the war. So the, the region uh, with the Caspian Sea also agreement and the potential energy developments there to uh, transit gas from Turkmenistan under the Caspian Sea to the Southern Gas Corridor and all the way to Europe is in a very, very different place today than it was in 1988 when uh, first Nagorno-Karabakh announced that it wants to be part of uh, Armenia and the Armenian parliament also uh, voted to accept Nagorno-Karabakh as part of Armenia. Uh, that said, um, the United States has been active in the MIS group. One of the co-chairs is the United States representative. Um, the MIS group co contains several 20 something, 20 plus countries, but there are three co-chairs, uh, Russia, uh, France, and the United States. As a uh, very active participant in, in that Troika, the United States has been trying to push for recognition for resolution of the conflict for many years. It's not a new position if the US administration steps in now as a media mediator. We remember the uh, key West negotiations in 2001 when an agreement was reached at that point between the two countries, um, but unfortunately the deal fell apart as soon as the both leaders went back home and their domestic publics were not a receive uh, recept, uh, receptive of the agreement made uh, in Florida. And then we had 9-11 a few months later, so our attention was also distracted into um, a different uh, realm. We needed the South Caucasus for our military operations as well. But now the United States has a really rare chance to uh, a valuable opportunity to begin decisive international mediation, not only to stop the armed conflict now, to uh, reach a ceasefire, but also to negotiate a durable settlement. Uh, previous formats uh, have not worked, unfortunately. We 
have to admit that the Minsk group format, the OSCE Minsk group format, did not produce tangible results. Uh, it was a great place to negotiate. It was a great place for theater very often, but not for a durable agreement. And unless we recognize that, even unless the United States government uh, recognizes that, we're not going to move forward and uh, try to find a good solution to the conflict. I believe that um, France is a weak party without the full force of the European Union. This is why I think a, a solution would require the United States and the European Union to work with the two countries, Armenia and Azerbaijan, to resolve the conflict. Russia is an interested party. Russia has exerted um, an inordinate influence in the process and prefers to have Armenia and Azerbaijan embroiled in a permanent dispute to pursue its divide and rule policy rather than have a solution. And if Russia is part of the three uh, countries co-chairs of uh, the Minsk group, so should be Turkey if we are talking about interested parties. Turkey is also an interested party because it has an agreement with uh, Azerbaijan from 2010, that military agreement includes um, much uh, much wider support for, for Azerbaijan in, in uh, times of conflict. And then we have uh, Iran that Alex, I'm sure that you're going to, to comment in this, but Iran is also in a very different position today than it was back in the late 80s when Iran was able to even host uh, negotiations and, and have some mediating effort within uh, within the conflict. Now, we have a very different position of Iran as well. So my answer to the question from LA Times, I don't think that the United States is on the side of Armenia or on the side of Azerbaijan. I think the United States sees the region as a potential uh, big trouble that could create uh, implications for not only the South Caucasus, but also for its policy in Central Asia, its policy with, with Turkey, its, uh, its uh, relations with Turkey, and also with uh, uh, its uh, connection to the Middle East. We have to remember we have several parties that have been selling weapons to uh, one or, or, or two of the countries, Russia mostly to, Azerba to Armenia, but also to Azerbaijan, uh, Turkey to Azerbaijan, Israel to Azerbaijan. So we have a situation at which uh, the United States government can end up with a very, very hot potato if this is not resolved quickly. <clears throat> the way I see the resolution is first the ceasefire agreement. If this could be negotiated on Friday, that would be excellent. And then move from there to uh, potentially agree with, uh, <coughs> achieve an agreement within the, um, the Madrid principles. Thank you. Marita, I, I love to comment on, on the issue of Iran. It's certainly fascinating. I think the Iranians would find themselves in an awkward position siding with Azerbaijan uh, more overtly than they are simply because Azerbaijan has such strategic close relations with the state of Israel, which we all know is not a necessarily good friend of Iran. But that is almost a separate uh, issue. And I know uh, Rauf will be leaving us a little bit earlier, so I want to get to him as soon as I can. But before I do that, uh, Margarita, could you say a few words uh, for pe perhaps people who haven't been following the conflict that closely? What has really changed in a major way, if any, since the uh, Key West Agreement of almost 20 years ago? I mean, give us a sort of, a, because the conflict is, is as old as it is. Yeah. But if you compare Key West Agreement to today, I mean, what, what does that make you feel in terms of optimism or pessimism? Well, the conflict, the conflict is older than the soldiers that are dying now in this conflict. Mm. This is the second Karabakh war. These kids were not born uh, when the conflict started. Uh, so this is the next generation of, uh, of people who are dying in a conflict that probably they didn't sign for. But uh, what is at stake here is, uh, I think that Armenia underestimated the determination of Azerbaijan to get those lands back. And I have to, when I say that those lands, I'm not talking necessarily about Nagorno-Karabakh itself. I'm talking about the seven areas that are surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh. And from these seven areas, we had 
almost 1 million uh, displaced uh, uh, people, uh, 750, 800,000 uh, people displaced from those particular um, regions. So this is Jabrail and the Fuzuli and the Lachin. Um, most of the internally displaced people are from there and they've struggled for many years living uh, in, in conditions that were not uh, favorable. Um, eventually this problem was more or less solved by Azerbaijan, but these people want to go back home. They want their, their land, they want their property, they want their houses. Uh, and there is a uh, decision by the European uh, Court of Human Rights that clearly uh, described Armenia as the occupy, uh, uh, occupier of those territories because Armenia is entirely in charge of um, um, Nagorno-Karabakh and the seven surrounding uh, regions. So, <clears throat> Um, can you, am I missing something about the question? Sorry. I'll come back to you. Let me move on to, to, to Ralph because Ralph will stay with us throughout the one hour panel, but he might switch his camera off. He can still hear us and hopefully answer questions. But Ralph, I wanted to give you a chance before you go, anything you've heard that you want to react to, anything else you want to add? Um, and then I guess one of the things that, you know, Mamuka's map got me thinking when I was looking at it, um, the so-called, I think it's called the Ganja Gap or the Ganja Corridor, the pipelines that travel in, in that narrow piece of land going to Turkey and onwards west. Um, I mean, what, do you get a sense that those pipelines, the energy infrastructure, and I understand from Amuka, uh, mostly are underground, uh, but how, how, how strategic of a target are they if this con conflict continues? Well, it would be unfair if I don't mention uh, the Armenia's official position. Um, Armenia has repeatedly announced that they don't have any intention uh, to attack uh, pipelines. Um, this was the official position of Yerevan, not the Armenian forces in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, but it was there. Uh, about the um, about the Ganja Gap and then and the pipelines. Uh, Mamuka is right. Uh, the, uh, the 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 pipelines are are buried uh, under the ground. Uh, they are being surveilled and they are being uh, protected. Uh, there are not many above ground installations within Azerbaijan, uh, but the major one is uh, is in in the vicinity of Baku, which is called Sangechal Terminal the thermal that receives the gas from the offshore fields in Caspian Basin. Mm -hmm. um, just to put it in the context, uh, it's four hour drive from the most Eastern point of Azerbaijan to the most Western port of Azerbaijan. So it's from, for Americans from Washington DC to New York, um, it's 450 kilometers or something. Uh, as, as you mentioned earlier about the about the, the, the weaponry, the, the modern weaponry that um, both Azerbaijan and Armenia have acquired. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, you, you're fine. Yeah. Um, this, with this, I'm not a military expert, but I, I believe that uh, with, in terms of the range, uh, this, um, this, these missiles can reach uh, a very long trajectory. Uh, Azerbaijani side uh, has has raised a concern, has made official position. Um, both uh, state oil company of Azerbaijan and the general prosecutor uh, that there was an attempt. Although these uh, explanations were uh, were not uh, detailed, but there were statements that um, both BTC pipeline and actually Baku Novorossiysk pipeline, which connects. Baku uh, with the Black Sea port of Novorossiysk in Russia uh, were uh, allegedly targeted by, by Armenian forces. Uh, nevertheless, um, Mamluka is right. These pipelines are underground. Um, the, uh, any, any um, and and then the both uh, consortium and uh, and the government of Azerbaijan, as as Mamuka said, have been clear that the flow of the of the gas and oil uh, through this uh, existing infrastructure has been continuing as it was before. Uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, for the obvious reasons, there are there are concerns, 
and hopefully um, these these concerns will not come to the reality. But uh, before going to that, I think as 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 Margarita mentioned, uh, we should we should emph emphasize the uh, the destruction that have been made to to civilian infrastructure, and I think it's our uh, it's our it's our duty to uh, to call for uh, for this kind of attacks to be to be stopped on both sides. I think that's that's worth to mention. I think that's more important. The human factor of this this problem is more important than anything. I, I want to come to Margarita one second before I do, Margarita, because Ralph might leave us any moment. I do have a question from the audience. What do you think this might, if this conflict as it is or if it expands, any po possible impact in terms of the energy policies? Um, pursued by the European Union as a block? Are they going to be moving towards more renewable? And I just want to put out, if you could, I, I think Azerbaijan's overall uh, on you might have mentioned is 650 to 700,000 barrels a day. What is that? About a 1% of the global oil output. Um, so uh, put this all in perspective for us. This question is to me, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah 600,000 barrels. The world consumes around I mean, before the COVID, it was consuming around 100 million barrels a day. Um, uh, and right now it's even lower than that because of the uh, disruption, uh, disruption in the demand and consumption. Um, yeah, it's it's almost less than 1%. Uh, the, um, in terms of the, the transition to the renewable energy, I think that process has started uh, Way before this conflict has started, and that's 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 a, that's a more general policy of the European Union to to tra transition towards the renewable energy. Um, I don't think these two processes are mutually exclusive, uh, and I don't think this conflict will will be a trigger or will will push European Union or, or the global industry towards a faster uh, transition to renewable. I I do believe that. The, the transition to renewable industry, with all the support that the the, the policymakers are, uh, are are conveying, must depend on the on the commercial reality. The commerciality of the uh, of this transition must be uh, will be probably the key determinant. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, if this con conflict prolongs, as Mamuka mentioned, um, it can cause concerns over the expansion uh, of, of this pipeline infrastructure within this corridor. And as, as Margarita mentioned, for, uh, for potential uh, transportation of, uh, of Turkmenistan gas uh, and Trans-Caspian pipeline, that could be uh, under, uh, under the question. But overall, the Europeans position, Europe's position is now is that natural gas is the, is the transition commodity it's it's less uh, it's it's inflicting less damage to the uh, environment than coal, uh, so it should be preferred to the coal, but it shouldn't be the end uh, goal. The end goal is of course the renewables. Thank you so much, Rob. And please do feel free to turn your video off whenever you have to go. And I'm hoping you still be online and here. There are some questions, but I thank you so much for so far being with us and hopefully stay with us for another 10 minutes if you can. Margarita, you had an intervention, please. Uh, talking about the Balkans, uh, talking about the Southern Gas Corridor and the deliveries of gas to the Balkans that are going to start soon, uh, because this is a very big pipeline. It starts uh, in Baku. It goes through the Caucasus, the South Caucasus pipeline. It continues into the uh, TANAP, which is the Trans-Anatolian pipeline going all the way to, uh, from uh, uh, one border of Turkey, from eastern border of Turkey to western border of Turkey, and then crossing the Balkans, uh, Greece and Albania, under the Adriatic Sea and going to Italy. That pipeline, uh, the last segment, the Trans-Adriatic trans, uh, pipeline, is going to be opened in a month. Uh, or, or two by the end of the year, and it's going to start delivering gas to the Balkans. And in terms of renewable energy, yes, the Balkan countries are making some progress in renewable energy, but that's going to take a long time. Um, at the same time, gas is absolutely essential to the Balkans because at the moment they are entirely 
uh, almost 100% dependent on Russian gas supplies. And that comes with uh, economic leverage, with political leverage, with meddling in internal affairs, as we could see throughout the Balkan countries. So 10 BCM of Russian gas have been uh, are being imported from uh, by the Balkan countries for all the way from Romania to Slovenia to Greece. If uh, half of this quantity is eventually replaced by Azerbaijani gas or gas from LNG sources, this is going to uh, save the Balkans from a lot of economic and political leverage of Russia uh, that uh, uh, Moscow is exercising in the moment. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add to Rauf's uh, uh, answer about uh, how uh, the pipelines threatened. Uh, yes, perception is the only reality. If perception is in business is a very, very big factor. If uh, businesses start perceiving the Caucasus as unstable place where we don't know whether we're going to have enough and how a gas supply or oil supply is going to reach uh, the markets, then we're going to have entire change of, of uh, equation here. It's, it's going to be, be different. But uh, what Azerbaijan is losing from this or Armenia, I think the entire region is losing a lot. Georgia as well, because Georgia is now an international energy transportation corridor due to Caspian energy. And Georgia is a NATO ally. Georgia is a uh, US ally. And Georgia matters to United States interest in the region a lot, uh, which uh, is not going to change anytime soon. Just to add another another um, answer to your previous question, what has changed has changed since 2001, since the Key West negotiations, we had the Madrid uh, agreement, and that agreement achieved in 2009 within the Minsk group of uh, uh, countries was actually was supposed to be a roadmap to solving the conflict, to resolving the problem by returning the seven territories uh, that are occupied by Armenia right now to Azerbaijan and working out a solution of how to deal with Nagorno-Karabakh, whether it was going to be a referendum or not, whether it's going to be highest level of autonomy, whether it's going to be independence or whatever option was on the table to be discussed within that format. Thank you so much, Margaret. We have about five minutes. I'm going to have two questions for you, for you each. Uh, um, and obviously, Ralph can jump in at any time he wishes. I don't want to disturb him as, as he's transiting to the next phase. Uh, let me start with you, Mamuka. The question here is, how do you see a modern, improved, effective arms control between Russia and the US, including Europe, of course, as a factor in reducing Russian um, you know, uh, threat to, to the Caspian uh, energy infrastructure. That's question number one. Let me give you the second one, uh, and maybe you can wrap them into one. And that is uh, on the trajectory of this conflict. What do you see this thing going? It's, as we said, we're almost a month into it. Uh, my, to answer to your first question, which relates to your earlier question about, you know, role the U.S. can play in the, in the conflict, I'm very skeptical that U.S. will really have any any significant leverage on parties to do something significant at this stage. There are only two parties, in my opinion, who has real power and leverage. Obviously, first is Russia, most influential, probably, actor that could influence the conflict. The second one is Turkey. And, uh, these are two uh, major actors who also have both military as well as political uh, po power, as well as will to uh, to uh, play a proactive role in the in the process. So I'm very skeptical that there will be any meaningful impact on conflict uh, by U.S. And because of the many different reasons, and it's it's a long conversation. We can talk about it probably for hours. But uh, but overall uh, departure from proactive position in the in the region uh, from United States. Uh, is, is one of the kind of, it's, it's reflected there. Margarita is right, U.S. has interest in, in, in some issues. Uh, U.S. is closely collaborating with Georgia. Uh, there are other um, elements uh, of interest, but uh, there is not the scale of uh, magnitude of interest at this stage that could impact. On, on the military side, I, don't, I mean, Russia is very interested in, the, in that agreement. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, it's, it's a good tool to bring uh, parties together, US and United, United States and Russia, and to have some 
because if, if both parties are interested in that agreement, that may bring some, uh, some incentives into conversation. And uh, uh, so that may have some impact. But again, it's probably, uh, it's not a conversation uh, that will impact this particular conflict because it's, con it's a long conversation. We are talking about months or maybe years. Uh, in terms of uh, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's going to happen with this conflict uh, going forward, I see uh, two potential major scenarios. One is the prolonged conflict, which I think will be the case. Uh, uh, and even if it stops with a ceasefire uh, and, and active military uh, confrontation is no longer there, we will be in new realities, which will be much less stable than we had uh, reality before. So, so that's why I see it as prolonged conflict. Another scenario is some kind of miraculous sort of solution of this, of this problem when, when somehow parties agree to go to, let's say, to Madrid principles and, and, uh, and, uh, and come to some kind of long-term solution, which is less likely. Uh, and my last point, unfortunately, Russia still operates in a, in a mode of the 90s when conflicts were a tool for impact on, on its neighbors. And if Russia had to change its attitude, and take some lessons from its, uh, let's say, uh, Crimea experience when, uh, when by taking Crimea, Crimea it alienated uh, and, uh, and uh, actually pushed Ukraine far away from Russia. Uh, or if, if uh, uh, Kabhazia and South Ossetia conflicts are lessons to Russia uh, to uh, actually push Georgia far away from, from Russia. Uh, uh, for these minor uh, conflicts, I mean, for minor territories and influences that Russia has there, uh, that would be a good solution. But I don't think that Russia is ready at this point today in this stage of its, 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 uh, its political economic development and so forth to take that uh, change, a drastic change from policies of 90s to something of 21st century. Thank you so much, Mamuka. And I know, Margarita, you literally have to leave at 10.30, but I did have two questions for you, if you want to take them quickly before you go. One is, what are the potential uh, for escalations militarily between Russia and Turkey in the South Caucasus? Bear in mind, there are already at loggerheads in places like Libya and Syria. And number two, the question is about this. Russia is already firmly in place in Armenia. Armenia cannot afford to lose Russia but Russia could lose Azerbaijan. Does that make it harder for Russia to balance this time around between the two countries? And please take as much time as you can afford, but the uh, floor is yours. You, you've got to unmute yourself, Margarita. The first question was about Russia and Turkey, right? Right. Um, Armenia, or let me go with the, with the last question. Between Armenia and, and Russia, uh, can Armenia afford to lose Russia? First of all, I don't think that Russia is going to intervene directly, militarily in this conflict, uh, particularly not against Turkey. That's going to be too big of a clash for anyone. And I don't think that any of the outside powers, such as the United States or Europe, are going to allow this to happen. I think there will be... Um, some kind of uh, sticking to their positions, Turkey becoming uh, more assertive in the South Caucasus and gaining more, um, more prominence, more leverage with Azerbaijan, potentially with Georgia, and Armenia staying in its uh, place of isolation. Unfortunately, Armenia is the country that lost the most of this conflict. It gained some territories that it um, controls for several years, and we understand its question of identity and... Uh, and uh, self-governance and so on, but uh, uh, Armenia ended up being isolated uh, from Turkey, from Azerbaijan, with uh, only two friends in the region, uh, Russia and Iran, and not even having uh, the right border with Russia. So if Russia wants to transfer weapons now to, uh, to uh, um, Armenia, <clears throat> they have to go through, through Iran to do that. They cannot do it uh, through Georgia anymore. So this is uh, not a, a place where Armenia wants to be to lose its last friend in the region, Russia. And I, I, at the same time, I don't think that Russia is going to intervene directly. What Russia is going to do is probably 
uh, insist to put uh, place peacekeepers in uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and uh, potentially keep the peace there until a solution is found. But uh, my last sentence is going to be, um, if the United States is ready to step in with this meeting on Friday uh, and then do something about this conflict, we can expect more initiatives from Russia. Until now, the United States was staying on the back seat. So um, this is going to cause more reaction by Russia and potentially uh, initiatives that they're going to put on the table and more effort to stop the fire and, uh, and uh, stop the fire and uh, uh, find some kind of a solution. Thank you very much. I have to leave now. And this was a great panel. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to Margarita. Thanks to Mamuka. Thanks to Rao for joining us for this one hour wonderful discussion. I certainly learned a lot. I hope you did as well. Thanks to everyone who sent their questions over. And last thing I say is I, I've traveled to South Caucasus. I love that part of the world. And I, I hope for a speedy resolution. I, you know, pray to enter this conflict and uh, for, for better days to come. But thanks again for joining us today. And that's Thank you.